at Martin's Beach. I have never heard an even approximately adequate explanation of the horror at Martin's Beach. Despite the large number of witnesses, no two accounts agree, and the testimony taken by local authorities contains the most amazing discrepancies. Perhaps this haziness is natural in view of the unheard-of character of the horror itself, the almost paralytic terror of all who saw it, and the efforts made by the fashionable Wavecrest Inn to hush it up after the publicity created by Professor Ahon's article. Are hypnotic powers confined to recognized humanity? Against all these obstacles, I am striving to present a coherent version, for I beheld the hideous occurrence, and believe it should be known in view of the appalling possibilities it suggests. Martin's Beach is once more popular as a watering place, but I shudder when I think of it. Indeed, I cannot look at the ocean at all now without shuddering. Fate is not always without a sense of drama and climax, hence the terrible happening of August 8, 1922. Swiftly followed a period of minor and agreeably wonder-fraught excitement at Martin's Beach. On May 17, the crew of the fishing smack Alma of Gloucester, under Captain James P. Orne, killed after a battle of nearly forty hours. A marine monster whose size and aspect produced the greatest possible stir in scientific circles and caused certain Boston naturalists to take every precaution for its taxidermic preservation. The object was some fifty feet in length, of roughly cylindrical shape, and about ten feet in diameter. It was unmistakably a gilled fish in its major affiliations but with certain curious modifications, such as rudimentary forelegs and six-toed feet in place of pectoral fins, which prompted the wildest speculation. Its extraordinary mouth, its thick and scaly hide, and its single, deep-set eye were wonders scarcely less remarkable than its colossal dimensions, and when the naturalists pronounced it an infant organism, which could not have been hatched more than a few days. Public interest mounted to extraordinary heights. Captain Orne, with typical Yankee shrewdness, obtained a vessel large enough to hold the object in its hull, and arranged for the exhibition of his prize. With judicious carpentry, he prepared what amounted to an excellent marine museum, and sailing south to the wealthy resort district of Martin's Beach, anchored at the hotel wharf and reaped a harvest of admission fees. The intrinsic marvellousness of the object, and the importance which it clearly bore in the minds of many scientific visitors from near and far, combined to make it the season's sensation. That it was absolutely unique, unique to a scientifically revolutionary degree, was well understood. The naturalists had shown plainly that it radically differed from the similarly immense fish caught off the Florida coast, that, while it was obviously an inhabitant of almost incredible depths, perhaps thousands of feet, its brain and principal organs indicated a development startlingly vast, and out of all proportion to anything hitherto associated with the fish tribe. On the morning of July 20, the sensation was increased by the loss of the vessel and its strange treasure. In the storm of the preceding night, it had broken from its moorings and vanished forever from the sight of man, carrying with it the guard who had slept aboard despite the threatening weather. Captain Orne, backed by extensive scientific interests, and aided by large numbers of fishing boats from Gloucester, 
made a thorough and exhaustive searching cruise, but with no result other than the prompting of interest and conversation. By August 7, hope was abandoned, and Captain Orne had returned to the Wavecrest Inn to wind up his business affairs at Martin's Beach and confer with certain of the scientific men who remained there. The horror came on August 8. It was in the twilight, when grey seabirds hovered low near the shore, and a rising moon began to make a glittering path across the waters. The scene is important to remember, for every impression counts. On the beach were several strollers and a few late bathers, stragglers from the distant cottage colony that rose modestly on a green hill to the north, or from the adjacent cliff-perched inn whose imposing towers proclaimed its allegiance to wealth and grandeur. Well within viewing distance was another set of spectators, the loungers on the inn's high-sealed and lantern-lighted veranda, who appeared to be enjoying the dance music from the sumptuous ballroom inside. These spectators, who included Captain Orne and his group of scientific confreres, joined the beach group before the horror progressed far, as did many more from the inn. Certainly there was no lack of witnesses, confused though their stories be with fear and doubt of what they saw. There is no exact record of the time the thing began, although the majority say that the fairly round moon was about a foot above the low-lying vapours of the horizon. They mention the moon because what they saw seemed subtly connected with it, a sort of stealthy, deliberate, menacing ripple which rolled in from the far skyline along the shimmering lane of reflected moonbeams yet which seemed to subside before it reached the shore. Many did not notice this ripple until reminded by later events, but it seems to have been very marked, differing in height and motion from the normal waves around it. Some called it cunning and calculating, and as it died away craftily by the black reefs afar out, there suddenly came, belching up out of the glitter-streaked brine, a cry of death, a scream of anguish and despair that moved pity even while it mocked it. First to respond to the cry were the two lifeguards then on duty, sturdy fellows in white bathing attire with their calling proclaimed in large red letters across their chests. Accustomed as they were to rescue work, and to the screams of the drowning, they could find nothing familiar in the unearthly ululation. Yet, with a trained sense of duty, they ignored the strangeness and proceeded to follow their usual course. Hastily seizing an air cushion, which, with its attached coil of rope, lay always at hand, one of them ran swiftly along the shore to the scene of the gathering crowd, whence, after whirling it about to gain momentum, he flung the hollow disc far out into the direction from which the sound had come. As the cushion disappeared in the waves, the crowd curiously awaited a sight of the hapless being whose distress had been so great, eager to see the rescue made by the massive rope. But that rescue was soon acknowledged to be no swift and easy matter, for, pull as they might on the rope, the two muscular guards could not move the object at the other end. Instead, they found that object pulling with equal or even greater force in the very opposite direction till in a few seconds they were dragged off their feet and into the water by the strange power which had seized on the proffered life-preserver. One of them, recovering himself, called immediately for help from the crowd on the shore, to whom he flung the remaining coil of rope, 
and in a moment the guards were seconded by all the hardier men, among whom Captain Orne was foremost. More than a dozen strong hands were now tugging desperately at the stout line, yet wholly without avail. Hard as they tugged, the strange force at the other end tugged harder, and since neither side relaxed for an instant, the rope became rigid as steel with the enormous strain. The struggling participants, as well as the spectators, were by this time consumed with curiosity as to the nature of the force in the sea. The idea of a drowning man had long been dismissed, and hints of whales, submarines, monsters, and demons now passed freely around. Where humanity had first led the rescuers, wonder kept them at their task, and they hauled with a grim determination to uncover the mystery. It being decided at last that a whale must have swallowed the air cushion, Captain Orne, as a natural leader, shouted to those on shore that a boat must be obtained in order to approach, harpoon, and land the unseen leviathan. Several men at once prepared to scatter in quest of a suitable craft, while others came to supplant the captain at the straining rope, since his place was logically with whatever boat party might be formed. His own idea of the situation was very broad, and by no means limited to whales, since he had to do with a monster so much stranger. He wondered what might be the acts and manifestations of an adult of the species of which the fifty-foot creature had been the merest infant. And now there developed with appalling suddenness the crucial fact which changed the entire scene from one of wonder to one of horror and dazed with fright the assembled band of toilers and onlookers. Captain Orne, turning to leave his post at the rope, found his hands held in their place with unaccountable strength, and in a moment he realized that he was unable to let go of the rope. His plight was instantly divined, and as each companion tested his own situation, the same condition was encountered. The fact could not be denied. Every struggler was irresistibly held in some mysterious bondage to the hempen line which was slowly, hideously, and relentlessly pulling them out to sea. Speechless horror ensued, a horror in which the spectators were petrified to utter inaction and mental chaos. Their complete demoralization is reflected in the conflicting accounts they give, and the sheepish excuses they offer for their seemingly callous inertia. I was one of them, and no. Even the strugglers, after a few frantic screams and futile groans, succumbed to the paralyzing influence, and kept silent and fatalistic in the face of unknown powers. There they stood in the pallid moonlight, blindly pulling against a spectral doom, and swaying monotonously backward and forward as the water rose first to their knees, then to their hips. The moon went partly under a cloud, and in the half-light the line of swaying men resembled some sinister and gigantic centipede, writhing in the clutch of a terrible, creeping death. Harder and harder grew the rope, as the tug in both directions increased, and the strands swelled with the undisturbed soaking of the rising waves. Slowly the tide advanced, till the sands, so lately peopled by laughing children and whispering lovers, were now swallowed by the inexorable flow. The herd of panic-stricken watchers surged blindly backward as the water crept above their feet while the frightful line of strugglers swayed hideously on, half submerged, and now at a substantial distance from their audience. Silence was complete. The crowd, 
having gained a huddling place beyond reach of the tide, stared in mute fascination, without offering a word of advice or encouragement, or attempting any kind of assistance. There was in the air a nightmare fear of impending evils such as the world had never before known. Minutes seemed lengthened into hours, and still that human snake of swaying torsos was seen above the fast-rising tide. Rhythmically it undulated, slowly, horribly, with the seal of doom upon it. Thicker clouds now passed over the ascending moon, and the glittering path on the waters faded nearly out. Very dimly writhed the serpentine line of nodding heads, with now and then the livid face of a backward-glancing victim gleaming pale in the darkness. Faster and faster gathered the clouds, till at length their angry rifts shot deep sharp tongues of febrile flame. Thunders rolled, softly at first, yet soon increasing to a deafening, maddening intensity. Then came a culminating crash, a shock whose reverberations seemed to shake land and sea alike, and on its heels a cloudburst whose drenching violence overpowered the darkened world as if the heavens themselves had opened to pour forth a vindictive torrent. The spectators, instinctively acting despite the absence of conscious and coherent thought, now retreated up the cliff steps to the hotel veranda. Rumours had reached the guests inside, so that the refugees found a state of terror nearly equal to their own. I think a few frightened words were uttered, but cannot be sure. Some, who were staying at the inn, retired in terror to their rooms, while others remained to watch the fast-sinking victims as the line of bobbing heads showed above the mounting waves in the fitful lightning flashes. I recall thinking of those heads, and the bulging eyes they must contain, eyes that might well reflect all the fright, panic, and delirium of a malignant universe, all the sorrow, sin, and misery. Blasted hopes and unfulfilled desires, fear, loathing and anguish of the ages since time's beginning, eyes alight with all the soul-wracking pain of eternally blazing infernos. And as I gazed out beyond the heads, my fancy conjured up still another eye, a single eye, equally alight yet with a purpose so revolting to my brain that the vision soon passed, held in the clutches of an unknown vice. The line of the damned dragged on, their silent screams and unuttered prayers known only to the demons of the black waves and the night wind. There now burst from the infuriate sky such a mad cataclysm of satanic sound that even the former crash seemed dwarfed. Amidst a blinding glare of descending fire, the voice of heaven resounded with the blasphemies of hell, and the mingled agony of all the lost reverberated in one apocalyptic, planet-rending peal of cyclopean din. It was the end of the storm, for with uncanny suddenness the rain ceased and the moon once more cast her pallid beams on a strangely quieted sea. There was no line of bobbing heads now. The waters were calm and deserted, and broken only by the fading ripples of what seemed to be a whirlpool far out in the path of the moonlight whence the strange cry had first come. But as I looked along that treacherous lane of silvery sheen, with fancy fevered and senses overwrought, there trickled upon my ears from some abysmal sunken waste the faint and sinister echoes of a laugh. 